main camera is. Purchasing. Is there any full purchasing? Yeah. Uh, so Chuck? Hey everyone, welcome back. Kyle with Andrew Hilton and welcome to our second uh, visit to Spain and our third visit to the Iberian continent. So second trip to Spain plus we had Portugal a few weeks ago. Uh, I am joined tonight by our first special guest in a couple of weeks. I'm joined by Matt Sherlock of Sedimentary Wines, who is the importer for the four wines. Hello, Matt. Hey, happy to have you. Um, so we've got some really different stuff here. We're not doing the kind of boring just introduction to Spain stuff here where we say oh well here's a Rioja and here's a Navarra and you know here's a Sherry and here's something from Ribera del Duero we've got something a little different for folks tonight um, why don't we talk a little bit about like your background in the wine industry and what took you to wine importing and indeed into wine making how long do you want me to spend on that <laughs> uh, let's let's say 30 seconds or less I started in restaurants, went into retail, then I went into vintage. Uh, first vintage was 2007 in New Zealand, and then California for vintage. Back to Vancouver in retail, went into education, teaching WSET. Uh, tried to figure out how to get out of retail. If you ever figure that out, let me know, because I've been trying for 20 years. Yeah. Well, it's good money if you own the place. Um, you let me know when that starts. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <come on. laughs> uh, got really fed up with the fact that I couldn't buy the wines I wanted to drink in Canada that I'd been drinking uh, traveling. So started started sedimentary, the import side, in 2010 at the same time was asked by a friend if I wanted to start a winery in the Okanagan and we were drunk and I said yes. So that happened at so all in 20, simultaneously. 2010. Yep. So you spent like three years without a minute's sleep. Yeah, closer to five, <laughs> I'd say. 20, 2016, I really felt like I'd stopped treading water a bit. Um, and here we are. And here we are. Well, let's uh, let's jump into the Vina Illusion. So these are a Rioja producer, but these are not the Riojas a lot of people are used to. I mean, most people are used to the you know usual four quality tiers that we see that are you know Yovan, Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva. It's all Tempranillo. It's all you know just the same thing we've seen a hundred thousand times before. But here we have a, a, a white, and I mean, it's not like Rio has not known for doing white, but they're not known, at least down in Lethbridge, for doing a ton of white. Uh, and Tempranillo Blanco is, globally at least, a fairly new grape variety. Uh, tell us about this one a little bit. So uh, Martin uh, the, and his wife, uh, they have two kids. Um, we, like all sedimentary things, we kind of fell ass backwards into finding them. We heard about them. Tasted the wines in uh, Paris accidentally, and we're like, "Man, these are these are good." Um, and then in February 2019, we just drove to his house, like we usually do. Um, knocked on his door. It was terrible. Actually, finding the place was impossible. Um, I. Got so I actually ended up dropping Mike off in their little town, and I tried to. I was stuck in the car for an hour, like trying not to rack up a two thousand dollar damage bill on the rental vehicle, trying to get back to where I'd left him. And uh, so, anyways, when we we met with them, Martin used to be a like a refrigeration sales guy kind of thing, like selling parts for stuff, and then uh, was a very enthusiastic. Um, gardener on the side and worked with like local markets and sold to some restaurants and then got the opportunity to buy a little bit of land so he has three plots uh, I'd say totaling maybe 10 hectares in three different spots um, and dove into winemaking um, this is a one vineyard so he has three sites we're gonna taste the Prana afterwards so he makes three wines from three vineyards essentially and he makes them at his buddy's winery in the corner um, tiny little like 
anti Rioja Rioja producer. He's really a a gardener and a a grower, less than he is a winemaker. Uh, and I love the wines. They're simple. They're easy. He's not trying to to be a, an important person um, from the wine point of view. I think he's making really important steps in the farming point of view. Um, yeah, he just kind of is quiet and uh, farms super good fruit and makes very simple wines. So Tempranillo Blanco is, like I said, a fairly new grape variety. It's it's a white mutant of the standard red Tempranillo variety that came out around the late 1980s and yep. has slowly been propagated up to being a commercial crop since then. Um, what do you get out of Tempranillo Blanco as contrasted to, say, other either international or other Spanish varieties as a white? Like Vallura or Chard, I guess you mean, which is allowed in Rio Hano. Um As of when? Shard, yeah. uh, 2004, 2005. Oh. Seems like an odd oh, yeah. fit with Rioja White, but all right. They let all of the shit in now up to, so I think Rioja White technically is still 49% Bayura, and then international varietals run amok. Yeah. But this is also the classic, like, massive wineries with international plantings, dumb decisions, just lobby the, the regulation board and say, let me use it. And that's been kind of the story of Spain for a long time compared to, say, some parts of Italy or certain parts of Portugal. It's just, it's, hey, here's some money, please. Let's plant us all the Merlot and Cabernet and Chardonnay here. And yep. that's, that's really been a story of Spain. Is that a, is that a corruption thing or is that just the, the Spanish wine authorities are just really easily bullied? I think it's uh, money, money rules. It's the same, like, for, dude, come on. You can get, you can put Merlot in your Chianti. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same difference. Why can you put Merlot and Chianti? Not because some traditionalist was like, "This is a really good idea." It's because someone with money planted a bunch of Merlot and they want to put it in their DOC Chianti. That's why. So same thing. Yeah, I just find um, it's even more prevalent in Spain than it is other international uh, regions. Just it seems sure. like it's everywhere. Just absolutely it's everywhere. Pretty loose. Pretty loose in Spain. I've found. I've only been working in Spain for two years, um, so I don't have a ton of history. I've done three trips, um, you know, where like Italy, you know, I've been 17 or 18 times, spent a lot more time. France, same, 17 to 20 times. And so I'm learning, I'm learning Spain, but it feels a lot looser for sure on the, on the um, regulation side. Uh, Tempranillo, I mean, it, it's still an earlyish ripening um, varietal, like like Mayura is too. Uh, easy to have like big big crops. Um, requires uh, some pretty stringent um, tonnage reduction to get wines with character, for example. Like hopefully what you're tasting right now. I think this is plenty of character. We'll talk about a tasting note in a minute. I know you don't have it in front of you, but I'll, I'll briefly touch on the tasting when I'm uh, kind of finished with the explanation with you. But um, it's, it's not a desperately aromatic variety, but it's got lots of pretty things going on here. Um, now, I assume with something like this, there'd be the temptation to, you know, create a huge, huge tonnage per acre. Do you want to... We haven't talked that much over the videos about vineyard management and about, you know, tonnage per hectare and about you know how important it is to minimize uh, crop yields in terms of concentration uh, you know balance of course against the idea of you know making something on the wine um, do you want to talk a little bit about just how important a role like reducing yields is in terms of the quality of the wine because that's actually a topic that as many of these videos will be done we haven't really talked about enough sure we can just briefly do macro and then micro so if we think about it on a a, ge a very generalized scale. Uh, one of the analogies I try to use with, you know, at, at the winery, talking to people, um, is if you grew an apple tree uh, and you had apples and you cut every single bud and flower off your tree except for one, and you let that tree grow one apple, arguably it would probably be the best apple in the world. The, best apple you've ever tasted because that tree's put all of its energy into the production of that one piece of fruit. It's the tree thinks its only survival mechanism is to make babies 
and I only have one shot at making a baby. And that apple's going to be fantastic. So it's going to be the most phenolically ripe for attraction of predators to eat it, to plant the seed, the, the most intense flavors. And it's going to have all of its resources available to it, to, the tree is, to put into that apple. The same principle applies in the vineyard. Uh, we're obviously not growing one bunch of grapes per vine, but uh, if we allow the plant to put more energy into less production than like anything in life that we do as humans as well, arguably the quality is going to be higher. That's the macro idea of, of crop reduction. I really don't see, I mean, the cynic in me says, okay, well, it's not the most aromatic. I could see how you could, you know, rip this up and you could plant Chardonnay, but it would make me very sad because this has such beautiful kind of lemon and peach and white grape and just lovely delicacy. And this is just perfect patio wine without that very typical just Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio overbearingness. I, I really love how charming and pretty this is. Yeah, I like the acidity. I like the alcohol level. Um, that's the kind of wines, like I said, Martin wants to make too. He's not he doesn't even t talk about like what the wines taste like. For him, the wines are just for they're for drinking. I mean, what, what what do you guys sell the wine for? I think twenty three, twenty four. Yeah, I mean to consider the way he farms and to drink a wine that's so so honest and good for the earth um, for that price is I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's move merrily right along. We'll get into the second wine from this winery, the Prana. Um, so this is the red from the same winery. Uh, for those at home, it is this one, the white label with the red writing. I for, forgive me that I did not introduce the white on the first instance. I just jumped right into the white and didn't introduce it. Um, so same winery. Um, so this is a Rioja red. Doesn't have any, you know, age designation, which I'm so happy about because I am absolutely done to death with Crianza and Reserva. That's what I first started really digging on when I first got into the wine industry like 20 years ago is please give me a Rioja Reserva because give me all of that oak and leather and you know microflora and everything else. Now it's like please stop. Just I'm done. I just want something bright and fresh and pretty and more true to the character of the vineyard. And this is very definitely that. Yep. Yeah. And again, in line with Martin's wines, he just it's he doesn't give a shit about any of the DOC regulations. He just wants you to drink it. The hilarious thing is that I've had this wine now back to 2011, and it ages ridiculously well, surprisingly. But well, not surprisingly. I mean, the numbers are there. There's low pH. There's high acidity. The fruit's ripe. It 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 should age, um, but it's a wine for drinking. And this sees partial carbonic, so half of the wine uh, grapes go through carbonic, and then the other half are de-stemmed, and then they're blended together. So let's talk a little bit about carbonic. We covered this a little bit uh, a few episodes ago, um, but carbonic's a really interesting process. It's, I think, really kind of enjoying a second sort of renaissance uh, in terms of how much people are using it again, and they're using it for more, more premium, more interesting wines than they used to. Um, Forgive me if this is a bit of a generalization, but I used to think carbonic, I used to think Beaujolais Nouveau, I used to think, oh, just short-lived wines that weren't all that desperately interesting. I realized that's a gross, gross oversimplification because most things you can say about any wine are gross oversimplification. But I think that it's, it's found a new home in premium wines and more, a new home in more interesting wines that maybe never went away on like a, a super hardcore wine nerd level, but maybe for the general public seeing wines with a with a heavy use of carbonic, I think is maybe having a renaissance in terms of how many consumer wines are starting to see that again, uh, at least at a higher quality level. Yeah. Sorry, was that a was question? a really long question. <laughs> that wasn't even a question. It was a statement that I asked you to respond to, and it was like two minutes long. Agreed. Sorry for that. Uh, that was terrible. That was a terrible interview question. That's fine. I mean, I, I, I agree with your statement. Um, I think also carbonic's been around a lot so yeah right george de Boeuf, garbage wines beaujolais de Boeuf, fine yep. carbonics used all the time but it became not cool to talk about its usage so it just came off labels it came off discussions in for marketing terms it, sales reps didn't want to because you saw Garbo carbonic you thought george de Boeuf. right 
but it's especially with the renaissance of natural wine um, it's a really useful tool because you you have a reductive atmosphere you have uh, a great co2 uh, coverage and you you can start fermentations without any uh, use of sulfur which is a lot of the goal of, of trying to make natural wine um, so there's a lot of uses in the natural wine process that are, are great with carbonic um, it also small amounts of it really can can boost aromatics and maybe you don't want to brag about the fact that you use carbonic because you don't want people to associate it with crappy Beaujolais but I think that those days I think it kind of passes I think post 2018 I think that with the idea of oh it's carbonic therefore it's Beaujolais I think I think we've left that impression well and firmly in the dust yeah I mean you're also in the wine industry my dad thinks carbonic is bad I assume my dad also thinks carbonic is bad I mean he knows better but you know I assume he also thinks carbonic is bad hi dad if you're watching yeah. I hope you're enjoying your Australian Shiraz. <laughs> Mine's probably drinking the same thing. <laughs> My dad's joining us actually on the channel next week for Australian Shiraz Week, so it'll be a lot of fun. Spoiler oh. everyone, next week's Australian Shiraz Week. Uh, I give him a hard time for this uh, all the time, but he has a fabulous palate. Uh, he started the store. Um, he still really likes Australian Shiraz. It's what he likes. And you know what? No shame in what you like. I'm, drink told there like. are, I'm told there's beer styles that aren't IPA. I don't drink them, but I'm told they exist. <laughs> so yeah, these are these are really wonderful, and they're not what I would expect from Rioja at all, um, which is a shame because they should be. This is the Renaissance in that's going to happen in Rioja, right? Um, oh, I have a picture of Martin. If you can see that, so he's very very proud of his dirt. Yes, he is. Like I said, he's he's more of a gardener and a farmer than a winemaker. So he made me um, smell his dirt all day, everywhere we went. He would say, smell my dirt. Uh, and it smelled great. It was really awesome. We would even uh, shovel up some dirt from his neighbors and show me how bad their dirt was. Was Didn't smell as good as Martin's dirt. Um, and that's just a matter of soil health. So they were using exactly. pesticides or they were heavily fertilizing and it was killing the soil. Exactly. So that's like, I mean, this is why we actually don't import anyone we don't visit. You can write whatever you want in your marketing brochure or your tech note, but going and literally sticking your head up the cow's ass to good, see how good the steak is, is the most important thing for us because your vineyard doesn't lie, period. So I really appreciate that Martin made me smell his dirt all afternoon because that's what I want to do. Yeah. Really, it, that's that's where you can tell you've actually got someone who knows what they're doing because it's it's taking it a step beyond. Um, I do want to just quickly, uh, I don't know if you want to do this or if I should do this, um, just a 30 seconds or less breakdown of what carbonic maceration is. Um, just for, We talked about it at a really high level, a really geeky level. Let's let's dial it back a little bit for the folks at home who maybe are now currently Googling it and go telling for it. us they're Googling it. You go for it, and if uh, there's something I think I need to add, then I'll do so. But sure. Uh, yeah. Carbonic maceration is effectively basically whole bunch fermentation. So rather than crushing the grapes, taking the juice, putting it in a fermenter, adding yeast or letting natural yeast blow in, uh, what you basically do is you take you know, whole bunches of grapes. You put them in a big stainless steel cylinder. You stack them on top of each other, even to the point of pressing them down a little bit, uh, to the point where there's very, very little space in between the grapes. And then you take a big CO2 canister and you basically pump out all of the actual oxygen in the tank. And then what actually happens is sitting inside that tank in an oxygen-free environment under the incredible pressure of the, the weight of the grapes above it, the juice inside the grapes actually starts to ferment on its own in a completely different uh, fermentation process from standard one fermentation. Uh, and that creates these bright, fruity, primary characters that you know, 20 years ago we'd be talking about as typical Beaujolais Nouveau characters, which is, of course, nonsense now. But they are they're different. And they're, they're prettier very often than, than, you know, what you would expect is your, your bog standard, you know, wine ferment in the presence of oxygen sort of characters. I glossed over a ton. What did I get wrong? No, that's, that's great. Uh, what I would add to that is one of the main aromatics we associate with carbonic from George de Boeuf is specifically from a yeast. I think it's called R47, and that's kind of the banana aromatic 
that we associate with carbonic. Oh, and but not that's, real banana, like fake banana, like those, those yeah, yeah, like those little candies. candies. It's not doesn't taste like real bananas. It tastes like synthetic banana. Yeah, that and that's that's from the yeast strain, not from the the process, and so and totally correct. And then I would also add what a lot of people are doing, and what I do, for, say at Lockenworth or. Um, for on our Merlot, is we're we're not using the traditional massive carbonic technique. What we're doing is keeping clusters whole, destemming some, adding some juice, and 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 doing internal carbonic. So you have a whole berry that basically sits, and you you have enough yeast sitting on the outside of the skin. You don't need to add gas. You don't need to cover it. That they they will start to ferment internally, and then burst. So like Lockenworth Merlot, which you guys have had. We have on the shelves right now, yeah. Right, so that that's internal carbonic on the bunch, on the whole berries. We don't gas cover, we just leave the berries whole, and then they start to ferment internally, and then burst. Then you get a lot brighter fruit character. So you can still do natural fermentation. The, the ferment's quite healthy, um, but you get just li more lifted aromatics doing it. But otherwise, yes. Correct. Everything you said. Speaking of which, I've got a bone to pick for you. With you, I haven't had Lockenworth Cab Franc for bloody months. Stop making it. Right. End the video. We're done here. We're just. We're done. Cool. Okay. <laughs> freeze my sign up things. <laughs> no. Why did you? Why did you stop making the Cab Franc? Because I really liked that wine. What was the? What was the process behind stopping making it? This oh. is it right now. You got a rosé or? Yeah. The same. Same vineyard, now it's this. Well, that's a great answer. Do we have that in Alberta yet, or is that BC only for the minute? It's in Alberta. Is it? I shipped uh, 20 cases to Artisan. Well, I, I'm... Ah, there's the text from Devin saying, yes, we're ordering that. Uh, so, yes, that's good. Oh, yeah, that looks really good. Okay, so let's jump on to the next. There's a bunch list. of shit in the bottom, though, so. Well, the, there's a bunch of shit in the bottom of every natural rosé we carry full stop. That's that's not new news. Uh, so let's jump on to the, uh, the next red here. Uh, let's jump in. So now we're back to Penedes. The, uh, now we're now on the uh, kind of the, the oddly named like east coast of Spain because it actually faces Italy in this part, so... It's sticking way out into the Mediterranean. It's hot as hell. It's absolutely baking. Um, you get the sea breeze, of course. Um, now, I'm getting all that from, you know, maps and, you know, descriptions. You've, I assume, been there. Obviously, you've been to all the wineries you import. Uh, tell us about the part of the world this comes from. Um, eh, sorry. Um, <laughs> just getting a phone call from Ross's wife. Who's my partner in the winery? But we'll deal with it later. Um, <laughs> okay. This is right outside of Barcelona, so you can you can get to these guys are about oh wow uh, an hour, forty five minutes, an hour at the most outside of Barcelona. Um, so Amos uh, and Alex, uh, Alex's parents have this massive bullshit cava company. I shouldn't say that. They have this massive Cava company <laughs> that makes lots of Cava and sells it for lots of money. Um, and Alex and Amos, Alex's son, Amos is this like weird buddy who's an awesome winemaker, does a great job. They basically took all of the resources from this huge industrial winery, pulled all the best vineyards and started making natural wine in the garage using all the resources of a multi-million dollar winery. Um, most of this region is planted to, to cava grapes, but they're focusing on um, red wine and white wines that are still, and they're, they're really yummy, and they're really fairly inexpensive considering uh, the types of vineyards they're working with. This is actually the vineyard where this comes from. It's one of the most beautiful walks down this really long path. And then you have 
hundred year old bush vine trained uh, Grenache and Tempranillo. But it's Spain, so the land's bought, labor's cheap, and they can make these really delicious everyday wines that are super honest and real for very little money. I'm really impressed with what they've done. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the sort of land that's now very often ripped up for the international varieties that we talked about earlier, but when you use the local varieties and you do it in an honest way, you get some really quite spectacular results. And I'll be honest, like, we... Uh, we thought there was something wrong with, you know, Spain. Oh, why is Spain not selling? Why is Spain dead? Well, no, it was our Spanish section. It was the Spanish wines we were choosing because we weren't bringing in things like this. Um, wines like this these days are selling just fine. It's, I, I worry a little bit about the Spanish industry and the, the guys who are still doing it the really old way because there's a lot of pride and a lot of tradition, a lot of quality there. But it's even among, like, serious wine people kind of falling out of fashion, which is a shame because I do still enjoy those wines to a certain extent. And they're, they're incredibly expensive to make. Yes. And, I mean, the aging is is the biggest expense. But, yeah, I agree. I, I would drink Lopez de Heredia any night. I would drink Chateau Iquet any any night. They're wonderful, wonderful old-school wines. Um, but there's a really exciting renaissance in Spain right now that you've got to think of the three convergences. You have... A tradition of winemaking, so you have people that know what they're doing and growing grapes. The land is really cheap, and you have cheap labor. That's where you can find the world's most exciting wines. And Spain is at the forefront of that right now. Spain, Portugal, Greece to a certain extent. Those yeah, are the I th keep hearing th about how amazing things in Greece are right now. I haven't seen it yet, but I keep hearing things are just like completely nuts, and I really want to try them, but I haven't seen them yet. I've tasted a lot. I have. I, I don't have the the capital or the resources to expand to an, another country. Unfortunately, so much of the problem is is logistics, organizing shipping. We don't have a, a we don't have a, a, a large brand that can anchor um, a uh, a shipping program, which is a real problem when you're dealing with small country slightly corrupt country as far as shipping goes. I mean, all shipping is corrupt, but it's just not going to happen. And I think the problem is that importers just don't see... Unfortunately, importers follow trends. This is the biggest problem why we don't have good wines to drink in Canada. Um, they don't create them. And no, I'm and, not... And there's like 10 trend. big import brands that control, you know, not in this store, but in your average liquor store, I'd say, you know, I won't say any particular brands, but they rhyme with Liquor Depot. Um, all of the wines in the entire store come from eight to ten agents, and they're none of their more experimental or challenging or boutique brands. They're just the stuff that they bring in to sell to Liquor Depot. And the way that conversation goes is Liquor Depot goes, we would like a Pinot Gris in the eleven ninety nine range with a package that looks like this. And an agent goes, okay, I'll find that. And they email people and find a wine. That's what we drink. That's what the consumer gets access to. The consumer doesn't get access to, you know, Matt getting on a plane, driving around Europe for weeks, finding, trying to find shit, even though it's not viable and then you guys actually buying it and then you guys actually doing the legwork of getting it in your consumer's glass because that's a lot of work for what nothing like, well the, the, the great the great great reward of that is we get it really really big and then one of the big boys steps in on the import side and steals the brand and then they sell it to liquor depot cutting up both of us and we get to do it all over again that's true uh, sometimes, but certainly not with me. The best part about our business model and the reason that we set it up that we don't import anyone we don't visit is that, and I say this right now, like go try to steal a winery from me. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, this isn't our beer tasting week, but that's part of the reason that we have our relationships with the breweries we do is, you know, what makes us different from every other store around is the relationship we have with, 88 and SYC and establishment and cabin and Snake Lake. Spoiler warning, our beer tasting next week is Snake Lake, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, oh, are you double fisting, Hand? Good Lord. All right. Settle down. It's, I know it's warm, but all right. Go on, then. Um, no. Uh, I, I think that those relationships 
when you can have, it's very difficult for a retailer to have a relationship with a winery, but you know, when we can have those direct relationships with our suppliers, it's, it's so invaluable. Um, like we have things on our shelves now that some of the breweries have been sold out of for two weeks and to have that ability to have that relationship where you can actually say, hey, you know, what can we do for each other? It's just incredible and I, I love being able to work directly with winery, wineries and breweries and whoever. It's more, it's more work. It's, it's less free money fast, but I think it's a much more satisfying, long-term, slow relationship that's um, enjoyable. Uh, I got a couple of questions here. We'll start at the bottom. So for people who asked questions earlier, um, this is just me being lazy. Uh, John asks, does the island of Crete make wine? Yes. Is it any good? I haven't had any. Fair enough. Moving on. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look here. Uh, Dave is definitely going to be pouring small wineries because, you know, it'd be boring if you didn't. Uh, Kevin says the Greece, Greek wines are amazing. Anything else we have for questions? Where's the map? The map will be around later. Not tonight because it's sitting in the office and I'm not going to go get it. Uh, but it'll be around next time. Mostly because it take really too long to, for me to explain to Aaron exactly where the map is stored. Um, yeah, uh, Craig's asking, Devin did answer this uh, briefly, but you know, we, we, we've spent a lot of time with the, the Bertha New England IPA movement about talking about why you know, the New England IPAs aren't cloudy because the beer is unfiltered, it's cloudy because there's a ton of protein in the beer. Um, when we're talking about wines that aren't you know, completely clear, um, are we talking about wines that are unfiltered? Are we talking about wines that actually have more protein than others? Uh, what may lead to a bit of haze in wine? Because I know there's a lot of different answers to that. Yes, there are, um, and I haven't totally figured it out. I've <laughs> made lots of wines. Well, all of our wines are unfined and unfiltered. Some throw a haze, some don't, and often it's uh, destabilization of protein, which I can't put my finger on from vintage to vintage, to be honest. Um, also, if we're going to bottle earlier, uh, tend, tend to throw more of a haze just because we have more solids because there's less of a settling period whereas if we go to bottle later so we started making Chardonnay two years ago and the first vintage we left in barrel for uh, 14 months came out absolutely crystal clear with, with zero additions or filtering or finding um, but if we go to bottle earlier there's just still turbidity in the wine so that that plays a role also nice uh so we are going to take a brief pause here so that i can introduce the upcoming beer tasting and wine tasting uh we will get on to the cava in a second so um we had actually quite an interesting debate over, over whether to start or finish with the cava so let's talk briefly about upcoming attractions here so let's talk about wednesday uh wednesday i would highly encourage you not to miss because uh, Adam from Snake Lake, you know, very often, uh, you know, not, not with Matt. Matt was delighted to do this because Matt's a prince of a man. But very often we, we kind of have to drag people, especially on the beer side, kicking and screaming to do these. Not because they don't want to, but because they've very often never been on camera before. Adam is absolutely chomping at the bit to do this tasting. He is so excited to do this. He has been, like, it's all been based around this taco IPA. It was like the second the taco IPA is in cans, he threw all of this in the back of his, like, you know, uh, SUV and drove it down to us so that we could have it like yesterday so we could do this beer tasting. Um, Snake Lake has been on board with this idea since like week three. They've been wanting to do it, desperate to do it. So this Wednesday, uh, we're going to do three Snake Lake beers because the only three tall cans we got. Um, so we have the Snake Lake Brighter Horizons, uh, which is a really interesting story because this was a beer that they actually did as a collaboration with Original Joe's. They had it all set up in kegs. It was going to be their beer just to the bar. And then COVID hit, so they had to run into cans instead. Um, really interesting story in that. Next up, we have the Taco IPA. Um, not just a name. 
Uh, this has flaked maize, tortilla chips, sea salt, and lime zest added uh, to make it a taco-influenced New England IPA. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that sounds terrible. That's what I thought. That sounds ridiculous. However, we opened one of these when they got here yesterday. It's actually pretty damn good. Uh, the lime is really forward, but I kind of like that extra acidity playing off of the tropical fruit of a traditional New England IPA. And finally, the Commodore Stout. Um, this has been a long-running beer for Snake Lake, but it's brand new in the tall cans. Uh, and this was actually a beer that Adam himself was instrumental in bringing into the Snake Lake portfolio. Now, you notice these aren't all Snake Lakes. We've got a Blind Men Brewing here as well. This is the Blind Men River Session, which uh, we just didn't do during our Blind Men Weekend. For some reason, we haven't actually done so far. Um, this is the beer that kind of I won't say kicked off Snake Lake, but this was really the, the first beer of the modern Alberta craft brew scene. Uh, I think it's to a certain point fair to say that this beer inspired all of, uh, all of Alberta craft beer kind of 2014 forward. So we're going to talk about, you know, Alberta craft beer as a history and as a scene in general, and then taste some really cool offbeat and different beers, uh, including a stout in the height of summer, which I think is going to be really fun. Uh, next week's wine tasting. Uh, I did hint at it. I did spoil it earlier. Uh, it is our, you know, slightly belated Father's Day wine tasting featuring my father, Max, who, of course, started Andrew Hilton, uh, as well as Darren Owers of Nugan Wines. So this is an Australian tasting. Um, so when we started back in 1985, you know, the whole world in terms of wine sales was old world. It was all Bordeaux and Germany and, you know, Spain was kind of the undiscovered country. Um, and then Australia came along and this store was to a very large part built on the emergence of California and Chile and especially Australia. So if, if you want to talk about, you know, Andrew Hilton, if you want to talk about the store that it is now, uh, it's built on a foundation of selling Australian wines, you know, before it was cool. So we have the head winemaker of Nugan. Uh, Mr. Owers, Darren Owers, he's going to be joining us for this, uh, as well as my dad. He's just going to be here, hanging out, talking about, you know, the store, its history, its a relationship with Australian wine, and just being here, right around Father's Day. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, I think this is going to be my favorite wine tasting so far. I mean, you know, sorry, Matt, but, you know, my dad's not here. So, uh, we are going to be doing that. Uh, that will be coming up next week. So, we've got some really, really neat stuff coming around the corner and that is next week uh i still have red wine in my glass so let's see if there's a little bit of uh questions um don asks uh describe the characteristics of this wine do you want to take this one on or do you want me to uh before that i have to apologize i realized i didn't put myself on mute and meant to when i took that phone call i'm, so, I'm very sorry to Aaron muted you don't worry about it nobody heard oh it. perfect great thank you uh, go for it. Um, no pressure. Just, just you know, doing the wine tasting for the person who's been to the winery and you know, imports the wine. D don't say anything truly mean. I live in a tiny village. I can't. I have no access to anything right now. <laughs> all right. Um, I wish. I wish to God I had all the wines in front of me. But okay. Uh, to me, right off the hop, I get a lot more spice and I get a, even a little more lifted aroma on this. I don't get as much primary fruit, but I get something. Right in that fennel seed, really pretty kind of licorice aroma right off the very, very hop from the, the top of the glass. Digging down, I get into red fruit, but not black. I don't, I don't get black cherry particularly. I don't get blackberries. I, I get more strawberry into raspberry into red cherry. Um, if I'm getting really imaginative, I might even say that some of the lighter, prettier stuff gets a little maraschino-y, but I'm probably just, you know, three glasses of wine into a wine tasting with that. The nose is pretty. I, I don't get I don't get any alcohol whatsoever, which I really appreciate. In the mouth, the fruit is the, the first thing I get, but I don't get it in that overcooked, jammy, it's hung on the vine till bloody December characteristic. It's got good acidity. I get salinity out of it. I get really nice fruit right through the middle. I get pretty earth, and it's it, it's coming off in a very dusty kind of almost do I ever say kind of like Chenin Blanc y kind of way in how the, the, the earthiness presents, which I really dig? Yeah, it, it's pretty, it's fun, it's got salt, it's got fruit, it's got a little bit of licorice. What else do you really want? I mean, it's, it's, it's lovely, like, and you folks at home can't tell, but 
these lights are hot as shit. So drinking a giant like 14.5% Australian red wine under these lights is brutal. This is exactly the type of red I want to be drinking. I like that note. And what I think when I hear you say that note is I think about growing and, and winemaking. And that's exactly – so varietal typicity is all there in the flavors you're tasting. But then structurally, all of that's because they're trying to make wine naturally. So picking earlier, retaining acidity is extremely important. It's really hard to make wine without um, additions if you have wines that are high in pH and low in acid. L low pH wines really help you stave off bacterial in in infection in the winery, especially when in the absence of sulfur. And you can have a lot more success with natural fermentations um, when you don't have a bunch of competing bacteria and funky aromatics uh, entering into the game. So there's there's a, there's a reason. I'm I'm really happy to hear you read your tasting note for varietal typicity, but there's a reason it tastes structurally that way, which is they're trying to make a make a wine naturally. So that you have to grow and pick with that in mind, which is exactly what you're describing: fresh, bright, forward, um, easy, easy wines that aren't fucked with, honestly. Yeah, I, I think we're three wines in, you can start dropping F-bombs, we're officially past the point of no return. Um. Well, you get in, you had my, my phone call on mute, otherwise you, I would be fired. <laughs> uh, you know, if they, if they ever got us on our early like pre-tasting conversations, I'd be fired half the time. I'd have to fire myself. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is just exactly right. Um, a lot of uh, chatter in the, the comments because we've had some conversations, uh, especially from Eric um, Mercier, about you know chilling some of these lighter red wines. People are saying, hey, are these red wines I could chill? I, I'd say, to me, I, I, I like the uh, El Vigneron as a chilled wine more than the Prana, but I think both would do. Yeah. Or are you just coming down the other side and saying no? Yeah, no, totally. Chill away. I like it. All right, let's, uh, oh, uh, did you miss what grapes are in this? Uh, yes, you did. I don't think we actually brought it up because we got talking about the winemaking. Um, happens when you're talking to a winemaker. We don't spend that much time talking about the, the grapes going into it. 90% uh, Tempranillo, 10% uh, Grenache, uh, and interestingly, uh, different vintages uh, of the two grape varieties. Uh, so this is not a vintage wine. It, uh, well, it says it's a vintage wine, and yet on the back it says it's grapes from different vintages. So, all right, sure. Um, comments? <laughs> this for them, so they do they do this red and they do a white in the same kind of level, is less about representing a place and more about being a wine for the people. So they, they will uh, blend 10% Grenache from a different vintage because the wine's better for it because it's just for drinky booze. And I like that. I, I, I love the I really feel like we need a death of the little sticker at the corner of the label that says 91 points by some wine <laughs> critic I probably haven't heard of on a wine under $25. It's like, I, I really want to see what absolute battery acid it would take to score under 85 points on like a wine review. You, you could actually like give them, you know, sewage at 13.5% alcohol and it would get 84 because that's the lowest thing they can score. As long as the samples are free, it's going to get... Exactly, as long as the samples are free. Yeah. And I don't know, I, I don't know if, about you, if, if you had the same problem when you were in retail, but like the, the number of samples that we haven't drank could fill like a surprisingly like large room. Like the amount of wine that we get in the average month that we're just like, okay, the interesting stuff, sure, it gets open, but just, hey, here's our 2195 California cab that's exactly like JLOR except it's a dollar more expensive and it doesn't have any brand recognition. Oh good, thank goodness that's here. Let's never taste that because we have no interest in ever bringing it in. Um, we end up with a lot of that. Uh, offline we can talk about what I used to do with those samples. Okay, now I just wanted to say it online, but alright, fine. Offline it is. I can tell you what I, we do with those samples, which is um, sure. not a whole desperately large amount. They tend to sit in a box till I need to make a spaghetti sauce. Um, man, I just that tastes like that tastes like vanilla. Sure. 
All right, let's uh, let's jump into the cava here. Uh, I actually opened this earlier because I very often have an allergy to cava. Uh, I opened this a few hours ago just so that I didn't have an allergic reaction to it live on camera if I was allergic to it. Uh, I'm not, which is wonderful because I love cava, uh, and I regret that I'm so often allergic to the good ones. Um, you know, I'm never allergic to the bad ones. Tragically, I can't ever, you know, turn my nose up at a glass of Frex and say, oh, no, I'm allergic. I mean, I can pretend, but... No, I, unfortunately, I'm only ever allergic to the good cavas. So uh, let's talk about cava in general, and then let's talk about this one here. Let's talk about your allergy for a second. All right, fire away. Why? What's your hypothesis? Um, so I react to cavas, some champagnes, New World Rieslings, and actually, for the very first time ever, uh, I actually reacted to a German Riesling last month. Um, cold climate Chardonnays on occasion and once a Savignon. It has to be a yeast thing. But bugger me if I know, because I can't track down a single common thread that those share. They're not genetically related across most of the species. They're not made the same way. Some are mallows, some are sparkling. I have no idea what the bloody hell it is. And when you threw in Savignon at the end. Yeah. I'd have to, I think I'd have to know all the producers. It could be something like, like some people are really allergic to, to blue copper, copper finding. Okay. I didn't think of that. Is it, is it fairly unusual? Because I drink, like, you know, as someone in the industry, I taste and drink a lot of wine. Yeah, blue yeah. copper finding, don't you laugh at me. Uh, is blue copper finding actually uh, fairly rare these days? Yeah, it's pretty harsh. But you'd use it if you had like a really bad mercaptan or sulfide problem aromatically. Like it strips the wine pretty hard. Okay. But but it could it could be used like on any given Sunday when someone runs into a big problem. It's not something you have in your tool belt to just like, oh, I'm gonna do that. It's like holy shit, this one's fucked. I'm gonna fix it with that. So, okay, so it's it's the nuclear option. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I'm just, if I knew all the specific wines, I think maybe we could have more of a detective game. Because yeah, with that it, list, it, It's been over pretty... the last 15 years. The, the worst of them was actually giving a live wine tasting on a patio at a restaurant to about 55 people. And the second wine was this super pretty uh, New Zealand Riesling. And I cracked the bottle and I poured all the guests a sample and I went up to talk about it. I took a sip. And my ear canals swelled shut. And what? then my throat started closing. It was like, I need to go to the ER. I will see you all later. So, yeah. No, I don't know what it is. Well, but so, Cava yeah, is something that happens I should have asked your symptoms first. If it's that severe, I bet you it's an additive. Yeah? Yeah. And not it a can't, common one. Can't exactly. Can't be a common one. Exactly. That's why I went immediately to, like, Blue Copper. Uh, Jeremy, it's it's not an eating something thing. Very often this is, um, A, I don't really have any food allergies, and I, I eat very adventurously. Um, and no, it, it, it tends to be just, it's always white. It's never red. It tends to be high acid whites. Um, and it can be from all over the world. Um, and I usually said it was either Chardonnay or Riesling, but I had a Cava three years ago I reacted to, and I had a Savignon last year that I reacted to. So it happens. Mm. I used to think it was all New World for the most part uh, until I reacted pardon me, the Cava and the German Riesling fairly recently. So, no, I, I don't know what it is. Was the Savignon uh, from Jura or is it California? Uh, it was an Australian Savignon, actually. Australian Savignon from mm -hmm. who? Uh, honestly, I don't recall. It was about three years ago-ish. Okay. Doesn't matter. Two, three years ago? I can't remember. Uh, so let's talk about Cava uh, first off. So the, the, the great sparkling wine of Spain... Uh, made in a very similar method to Champagne, uses, you know, apart from the o odious intrusion of Chardonnay into the region, by and large its own native grapes. Um, talk to me about Cava. What do you like about Cava? What does Cava mean to you? And Cava's mostly garbage. It's, uh, yeah, diluted. It's the only DOC, DO in Spain that can come from anywhere. So Cava's not um, regulated to a region. We all think of Penedes as where Cava comes from, but you can make Cava anywhere in Spain. 
Ball Cava, as long as it's um, within their now bullshit uh, grape varietal regulations and methods. Uh, methods are pretty weak. It's second fermentation in bottle. I think minimums eight months on lees sort of idea. So it's just like generic sparkling wine that's not as bad as bad per second. Sounds like Cremont, really. That's probably yep. the Cremont regs. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yep. So, yeah, um, they, they like to pitch it as being you know the same sort of stringent characteristics as champagne. It's not. Um, they like to pitch it as kind of the super premium region, and it can be. Um, some of the higher end yep. cabas are brilliant. Um, yep. But they're they're broadly not. But this is quite interesting. I quite like the Mirgan here. Um, tell us about this. Why why is this you know rising above that you know callous Cava crowd? Yeah, it's definitely better than the crap. This is their like young vines entry level Cava, so biodynamically farmed. This winery is amazing. It's it's like fifteen minutes out of Barcelona, but it's in a national park. It's protected. It's in a bowl. It's crazy. You're like you're in Barcelona, and then 15 minutes later, you're in a, basically a nature reserve that has vineyard. It's really really cool. They have they have money. They've they've been successful. Um, so they've got all the toys, but they're doing they're spending their money in all the right places, which is great. This is uh, all three traditional Cava varietals: Macabeo, Chirello. And uh, Perietta. Thank you, sir. Perietta. <laughs> a little bit of a Guinness brain fart there. You know, if if you jump in when I brain fart, I think we're even. Okay, great. <laughs> um, stainless steel, thirty months on lees, so uh, you know above above the minimum regulations. But the difference is the fruit's good, right? I mean, the easiest thing was with shitty sparkling wine. It's the most brilliant idea because you can crop high, pick early, and then you manipulate the crap out of it and make something that's really not very expensive because your your cost of goods is so low. And then you put it in a frosted black bottle and it tastes like palm olive dish soap and you buy yeah. an ad in Men's Health and away you go. Yeah. And you like sponsor the Oscars or something. Yeah. And there you everyone wants to. Yeah. Um, this is actually really well grown fruit <laughs> made in a nice way that's not fucked with. And it's just a nice sparkling wine that's honest. I appreciate that. I, I like that about this. Um, one of the questions I'd have is, you know, I, I think about Panadis, and again, you've been there, I haven't, but it has to be absolutely blisteringly hot. How do you make a wine with this much, like, bright, fresh acidity out of such an absolute kiln of a wine region? V vineyard management. You just hold more leaf, canopy management. That, that's where the work is like honestly for me like it's so boring to talk about the finished wines because all the work is in <laughs> in growing the fruit and then making it and then it's like oh the wine tastes like strawberries great I mean it's like kissing your sister who cares like <laughs> I think this is my I think this is the first time we've ever had a full of belly laugh out of Aaron uh, this is my favorite wine tasting uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I get point, you. I mean, the point, the point being, there's a lot of work to be done in the vineyard, depending on your climate. Like I work with the Sauvignon Blanc vineyard down in Oliver, south of here. That's I put it similar to Penedès in heat in degree days. Uh, in degree days, less, but in like rainfall and extreme days. And man, like I, we pretty much grew leaves, not grapes. That's how you have to work. Just like, massive canopy. Massive canopy. Uh, unfortunately, down there, the water was on too much, which really reduces your grape quality. But I didn't own the vineyard. We don't own the vineyard, and we lost it. But here um, at Alto Alela, ton, tons of biomass in the soil. It's, an, it's, it's a beautiful – everything is organic. There's no chemical input whatsoever. So there's a ton of um, – for example – Cover crops in rows can extremely help help with shade, can keep biomass in your soil, can stop you from drying out. Again, leaves, like I mentioned, actually holding more crop, not less, can allow you to, so when we talked about growing one apple on an apple tree, sometimes you actually want to push your crop level a little bit higher so that 
you have uh, you can retard your maturation so that you can pick later at similar numbers because you have so much heat. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. Yes. Yeah. So that's exactly what we did down at that uh, Sil Blanc Vineyard was we ended up going from like three to five tons from vintage to vintage, which might be counterintuitive on quality, but it actually allowed us to, to pick a lot later with better maturation at the numbers we wanted. When I say numbers, I mean acid, pH, sugar levels. No, and that's one of those things you can't really say, oh, well, this producer went from three tons per hectare to five tons, and now all the wines are terrible. Well, it's it's one metric. It's it's one number that, you know, in a vacuum, sure, that sounds really bad, but it doesn't necessarily speak to what's actually going in the wine, or it doesn't speak to the stress yep. that the vines are under. It doesn't speak to the, the age of the vines. It doesn't speak to anything. Um, no, I, I, mean, I think that's a good I started the conversation point. About, about crop load, and I said, let's talk about macro and micro. We just talked about macro, and micro is site specificity and how you deal with that. Um, because that rule, that idea does not apply all the time. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing with Lock and Worth right now? It doesn't have to be a long thing. It doesn't have to be a giant sales pitch. But uh, what are you doing with Lock and Worth? And what can people here in Alberta buy? Or what should they be looking out that has your incredibly personal fingerprints all over it? I don't know. I don't have a... Okay, how about this? I, I can get the rosé and I have the Semsov and the Merlot on the shelf right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> I like that. That's a nice short answer. Um, Matt, I'm going to give people like a couple of questions uh, here because I have a few coming in. Um, yeah, Jeremy asks, uh, Cava versus Champagne versus Prosecco, uh, just uh, in terms of winemaking. Uh, okay, so on the macro, all are garbage. But on the micro, there's some really, really good stuff happening at tons of levels. So if we look at the base level, Champagne is the, is the winner from a qualitative point of view. And then Cava comes, comes next, next, next to Cremant uh, in France. And then Prosecco has the lowest standard level by far. I mean... It's basically soda pop, yeah, in a big tank. However, um, there's amazing things happening in, in Spain from a cava. The best cava producers are now leaving the cavadillo. To give you an example, because they're saying garbage. We make much better wine than cava regulates, so we're we're gonna do our own thing. So they, My, they're gonna apply for Pago status, and so they're just like Pago de Valence, uh, Valencia, like Do, or what are they? They're 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 just keeping it in house, just calling it bubbles, like whatever their brand is. No Do. Like badasses, I like it. Yep, and the same's happening in Prosecco. So we have the Colfondo movement, which is the uh, secondary fermentation in bottle without disgorgement. Colfondo means basically with with lees with sediment. And this is the way Prosecco was originally made 60 years ago and then backwards before the big houses discovered Charmat method or Charmat method was, was basically created. And there's, there's profound Prosecco being made right now. But the biggest problem is, you know, they're 30, 40 bucks and your average person doesn't want to spend 30, 40 bucks on Prosecco because they want it. Yeah, I, I will say we, we have Proseccos that are Colfondo that are not, I mean, I've had the really high-end stuff and it's great, but I mean, I, we, have, we have a couple of Colfondos that are 25, 26, and they're great. They're not, you know, the most fascinating thing in the world, but they're a hell of a lot better than, you know, Zonin yeah. or Lamarca or what have you. What, which ones do you have? We have Case Palines, uh, and I can't remember what the other one we have right now is. Devin would kill me if he knew I wasn't remembering. Uh, he'll probably pop in the comments and tell you exactly not only what wines they are, but what vintage they are, but I don't remember. Um, cool. Yeah, there's uh, the, the other problem with Cofundo is that all the big boys now make Cofundo because they realize they're losing cred, which is too bad. This is classic, though, right? Again, you got to stick your head up the cow's ass. So. Yeah. No, I, I feel you. Uh, and then yep. the other question uh, that's really interesting is, um, and I, I do know the answer to this, but do they sample pH and sugar levels prior to harvest? Uh, Craig, they, they sample a lot more than that. Um, 
the 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 sampling that goes on in the vineyard um, is these days quite quite remarkably intense. Uh, do you want to talk about a little bit about you know what you actually sample prior to harvest and how you sample it? Well, what I sample and what you can sample are very different things. Well, let's uh, let's talk about both then. Sure. Yeah, you can measure. Uh, what you would want to measure mostly, if you had the resources and the time, would be your sugar levels, your phenolics, your levels of acidity. So that's a really important thing, like how much malic, how much tartaric, how much citric do you have in in your in your fruit, because that's really going to affect fermentation. And if you're going to make adjustments to acid uh, and pH, you need you need to know those numbers. Um, so those are the big things you would measure. So potential alcohol and your different, different acidity levels would be off the vine. Um, because, and, and pH, because you're going to, you're going to want, if you're going to make adjustments, you're going to want to adjust your pH arguably before fermentation. I think it's a much better time to do it. It's way better. The wine feels a lot more integrated. We don't do that, but I've definitely worked in wineries and made wines that pH has been adjusted early. Um, Can you and talk late. about what that does to the wine and why you don't do it? And that's a question of do you want to, not will you. If you don't want to, we'll move on. I, I, we don't want to adjust pH because you're... Okay. If we take wine as an agricultural product that represents time and place through a glass of beverage, then adjusting pH would eliminate or obfuscate time. That's why I don't want to adjust pH. Nope, I completely respect that. That's about the answer I expected, but thank you for saying it. That was actually about 500 words less than I would have needed to say exactly the same thing. If you want to make a wine that I think you want, if I want to make a wine, someone has told me probably, or some fucking focus group, or my brain has told me you want to drink, I'm going to adjust pH to make that wine for you. Which is 90% of the world's, 99% of the world's, 95 probably. I mean, wine. if people were making wine for what I wanted to drink, I'd be Robert Parker, and then I'd be, compl I'd be way more insufferable than I am now. So, yes. no. I mean, nobody's making wine for me. I, or th they are. They're, peop they're, they're people like yourself. They're, they're the people making wine for me. But on a, on a broad scale, nobody's making wine for me because, you know, you take the survey and it's like, which of these beverages have you had in the last 30 days? And it's like, have you had a cab or a Shiraz or something? Like, I don't know if you ever taken one of these surveys, but I actually got a call back from the people who took the survey and like, you ticked yes to every single grape variety. I was like, <laughs> yes, I did. Well, what do you do? I run a wine store. Oh, you're exempted from the survey, and they just hung up on me. So, right. yeah, right. <laughs> nobody makes wine for me. And I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. I, like, wh whoever can afford a marketing team and a research arm, they're making, they're making alcoholic beverage, not wine, right? This is the big difference. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Uh, so normally when I buy bubbly, it's so I have something to put Chambord in. Um, buy something inexpensive because the Chambord is going to cover up whatever you're putting in. Please don't buy like big brand stuff. Uh, I think Juicy makes a perfectly lovely declassified Prosecco. Uh, they call it just Juicy Extra Dry. I think we sell it for like $14.95. Uh, if you're going to put Chambord in it, that's that's spot on. That's what I would do uh, genuinely. You know, you know what we do at home, honestly? Like... Find a, a well-made, decent white. Like even the Rioja white, like, you know, 20 bucks. It's not yeah. cheap, but it's fine. We have a soda stream at home. So I do – I drink this all the time. I do – so I use like my Sauvignon Blanc Semillon that we make. And I do a couple ounces of Sauv Sem, three or four ounces of soda water, and a splash of Aperol or Chambord or whatever the hell you do with your bubbles. And then I'm not drinking some garbage – yeah. So split your split. Buy a decent white wine. You're only using four, five, six ounces if you have a couple glasses in your in your bubbles, and then just split it with soda. People always say they, they make fun of me when I say that the the least big wine nerds in the world are people who work in the industries. But I think this is, 
I think this is exactly the, uh, the the case in point. I don't think there's a wine writer that, you know, again, not that I have any use for wine writers, but um, they would ever say, hey, put your really nice, like, inexpensive white wine in a soda stream and carbonate it yourself and put your Chambord in that. But I would do that happily. And then I'd pour it over ice with, like, a, a piece yep. of lime, and it'd be lovely. It'd be a beautiful exactly beverage. And we, and we know we're not we're not supporting some massive, I mean, Chambord's Chambord, but we're not, like, it costs a lot more and is harder on the earth to grow garbage wine than it is to make liquor. So, I mean, I always say if you like vanilla, chocolate, high alcohol in your wine, don't buy wine. Just get vodka in a bounty bar and some fucking grape juice. You'll save the planet a whole bunch of effort and water and you'll get drunk faster. Yeah. And, and we'll, you'll broadly increase the quality of wine on earth because you won't be buying that nonsense, wasting shell spots. Because I only have 978 shell spots in the whole store. I, I'm sad that I know that number off the top of my head, but I do. Um, if I could take out all those booze Cali bombs, I'd have 22 more for something better. Um, yeah, it, it, it is kind of funny that way. Uh, what is Chambord? Chambord is a blackberry liqueur from France uh, for absolutely no accountable reason is two to three times as expensive as a slightly better creme de cassis. It comes in a fancy bottle with a crown on it. Um, it it's like creme de cassis, but worse and three times as expensive. Please buy a creme de cassis for nineteen ninety five instead of that jazz for like 46 Please. Good man. Good man. I think we get along just fine, Matt. I'm glad you're here. This is a good night. <laughs> I feel like I'm drinking with a friend to a certain point. This is good. What's next? Mm. What is next? I mean, we've, we've got question and answer. Um, I don't know. What uh, what is sedimentary got coming into the province the next little while? Like, what should people, you know, quote unquote, get hype for? Uh, We're like, broken shit, dude. Hmm? <laughs> We're broke. We're broke as shit. <laughs> Welcome to the COVID world. Everybody's broke as shit. Yeah. We, um, so Spain was our big expansion two years ago, and we're done. We shut the book down. Um, it's a, I mean, we're, we're a two-man ownership company with Silvana, who helps us um, immensely. So we have one employee. We have no salespeople. Um, and we have 60 suppliers. Like, it's... It's not. Uh, there's no growth for us, and 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 the way that we've set it up, we're not gonna. We're not gonna throw our principles out the window to just get something that's volume. We're really, really, really happy with everyone we work with. We don't drop people. We work with them for years and years, and we love them. So, no, I, I've said you know privately, not publicly, but. I would rather burn this place to the ground than carry, you know, all the apothic flavors and all the Bud Light flavors. Like, you know, I feel like my fire insurance is going to go up, but, you know. And I, I understand bills have to be paid. We're, we're just, I mean, Mike and I have other jobs. I mean, we spend a ton of time on sedimentary, but we don't have to. The only reason sedimentary exists is because we don't make any money on it. Let's put it that way. It's a project of joy and no money. We have in in ten years we have neither of us have taken a dollar. I feel kind Which of bad because I've made a lot of money on sedimentary wines. I love your stuff, but great, great. It keeps us going to Europe. It keeps us visiting our friends. Um, Which is a, a certain a, lifestyle that one cannot deny. I still have not been to mainland Europe. Been to Scotland a couple of times. Yep, bought some casks of whiskey. Done, done that side. Still haven't been to like France, or Spain, or Italy. I live on maps. Love maps. Still haven't gotten to go. Well, I mean, we'd be happy to drive you around. I think that could be arranged. I think mm -hmm. it must definitely be arranged. I'd be in for that. I mean, Devin I got to go on the last crazy big trip that the Austrian government paid for. I can pay for this oh, one. Oh yeah, right. They do that. They do that. Lousy Austrians. So yeah, we're 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 set with sedimentary with our suppliers. I mean, with all of our connections and people, I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm like, we, I'd love to work with the 
from a business point of view, like I love our book. It's great. We're set. And uh, we're just going to, we say we're going to keep doing the same things we're doing and pay ourselves in time because we now, we've been through it all. It's the same with, with Lock and Worth that we're not paying ourselves in money, paying ourselves in time, working smarter. It's not about owning a boat. It's just, you know, staying in sustainable business and sustainability for our employees, for us, and feeling happy about what we do every day, not having to make decisions that are shitty. Yeah. Get rid of shitty decisions. Yeah. No, I, I know. I, we, um, we've learned a lot out of COVID about shitty decisions and having to, to make really bad things and put bad products on the shelves just because a restaurant or two wants them. And now it's like, you want that? Fine, buy the case. Well, we don't want to buy the case. Then, then shop somewhere else. I'm done. I, I, we have now, we, we kind of have this, this, you know, never the two circles shall cross point of view regarding our, our shelf space. You know, if we've been, you know, had an absolute dearth of creativity and nothing good has come along and the shelves look absolutely picked over, we'll put restaurant wines on the shelf. But there's the retail wines and then there's the restaurant wines and nary the two shall ever cross unless they happen to be, you know, in line with our own values. But for a very long time, just no. Huge chunk of our shelf spot, I won't say a quarter, but it was probably a fifth, was wines that we were carrying for restaurants that none of us here had any use for or respect for. It was just, we sold around them and we just got tired of it. We just got so, so tired of it and done with it. Uh, so I, I've been ignoring the same, the same question, by the way, for, for quite a while. Um, uh, what do you look for when you drink bubbles? They're, they're, they're having trouble getting around the carbonation and, and finding that, that particular quality in the sparkling one they're looking for. What, what do you look for when you taste bubbles? And I'll answer the same thing after you. In the bubble itself is... Uh, in sparkling one in general, sorry. The same thing I look for in a regular wine, just with, with bubbles. So are the bubbles integrated? Are they part of the structure of the wine? Do they, for example, in like poor bubbles, they will often feel big and like soda water, like and then gone. In high quality bubble, we'll have what is often termed fine mousse, which is, I think this should be a cartoon with the head character being a, a fine mousse. Yes, in a, in a beret and like a three-piece yeah, suit. Exactly. Yes, he's a very yeah. fine mousse. Yes. This is a, a very I, I have yet to, uh, to come across a fine mousse. Like it's slightly, you know, more. I, I, from somebody who does beer too, it's like, wow, that tastes like it's got a nitrogen instead of like CO2. Exactly. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, like, like a pop of bubbles um, versus like one that's really well integrated, which is generally like feels tighter and smaller and also lingers in the glass and in your mouth a lot longer. Um, and then everything else structurally is the same, like aromatics. Are they, are they clean, pronounced, expressive on the palate? Is there uh, length, varietal character? Um, balance when I was in retail years and years ago buying champagne it was the first champagne was the first European section or or non-DC section I was given and I eliminated all um, non-grower champagnes there was very few in the BC market at the time but what we would do is get the champagne put it in a decanter leave it overnight so it was warm and flat and then blind taste all the still or the vinclairs the next day and that really gave me a, an insight into how manipulated um, bubbles can be it's a very interesting experiment to do at home I know it's a waste of wine but if you leave two or three ounces in the bottom of your bottle just pour it in a water cup and leave it on the counter overnight with the plastic on top for bugs and stuff but taste taste your your bubbles warm and flat and that gives you uh, a, a reference point for what the base of the product is and you'll be surprised how bad most of it is and it's the best way to look at 
But th- then you can create a metric. And once you have that base metric, say you do that 10 times with 10 different bubbles, you can go back and start piecing together what cold and sparkling bubbles taste like with uh, a, f- a flat, warm version and looking at quality in that sense because you, you'll have a metric for it. Well, Matt, thank you so much. This was um, this was amazing, actually. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. I, I, I was 70%. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, yeah. I really appreciate your guys' support, and if there's anyone still on, I have no idea how Skype works, so I don't know if anyone's like listening to us anymore. But um, I know there's still people listening to us. Uh, they'll be listening to us till Aaron gives me the wink that nothing's uh, nothing's still on video, but uh, there'll still be people leaving comments on the video. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, is this uh, recorded, by the way? Yeah, they're recorded. You'll you'll get oh, all of this. You'll you'll get to see how terrible I look doing these, and so sweaty and so shiny from is these this, ridiculously hot lights. Is this going to be on the internet? <laughs> yes. Oh my God! I know. People are gonna like Google your name, and they're gonna find this. Are you serious? Yeah. It is. It, it his live streamed. I mean, we we can we can talk after, and we can take this down after thirty days or something for you. Like, if it's an issue, we're happy to That's work with. That's probably you. best. I don't yeah. like to be on the internet. If you guys you guys use do your promotional thing, and then maybe we'll just delete it from. Aaron, will we make that happen 30 days? Yeah. It'll be up for 28 to 30 days, and then this one will mysteriously. It's probably the fact that this is actually the most fun one we've ever done because you're an amazing guest. Um, Can you just, can you put on, what's that? When when it expires, can you put, you weren't there so you don't know? Sure. Yes, yes, Aaron will do that. And then that will drive people to maybe look, look at more of your things. Only Patreon will get access to it. Yes, only Patreon will have access to our exclusive content. (laughs) For two ninety nine a month, you get access to the Matt Sherlock interview. Uh, you're behind a paywall, sir. <laughs> you are our official explicit content. You have, you have. Uh, that's one of my top five goals in life: is to be behind a paywall. I've always wanted to be behind a paywall. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, you guys, thank you so much for your support and uh, for what you do for independent producers and um, that you care. Yeah. It really means a lot to us. Thanks, Matt. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much for joining us. And, yeah, we will, uh, we'll make sure that this video goes down in about four weeks and it will no longer exist. Or we'll put it behind a paywall. Paywall. On, on Pornhub. Yeah. So you'll be- <laughs> I would love, you know what? If you, because Aaron seems to be fancy with the Internet, right? He is. He's a very fancy man. Yeah, so, I mean, we were texting like a hot damn. So if he could put it behind a paywall, whatever money is generated, uh, next time in Lethbridge, we, we'll go out for, for a nice lunch. Ooh, that could be fun. We could spend paywall yeah, yeah, money. Yeah, Aaron's giving us the big thumbs month. up. We can make that happen. Keep 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 track of that number, and uh, we might have a couple chicken burgers. All right, that sounds pretty good. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful night. Take care. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Now, that right there was the uh, incredible human being, Matt Sherlock, uh, in what has to be my favorite one interview uh, of our series so far, our very young series. Uh, So, yeah, we are uh, here at the end of another online wine tasting, uh, and one that I will never forget. Uh, (laughs) Thank you all so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun for me. it was maybe our nerdiest, certainly our sweariest, uh, and maybe our most irreverent one yet, and I enjoyed every second of it. Uh, for Andrew Hilton, I'm Kyle. Uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a slice, folks. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>